Well, hello and welcome to the Wine Access Unfiltered Podcast. I'm Amanda McCrossin and I've had a nice Long summer break. I hope you all are enjoying your summer as well. I've been traveling around, going to Europe, looking for good wines, drinking a few as well. And now we are back. And since it is the summer, we had to throw a little pink wine in here, of course. So I uh, I decided to theme it a little differently this time around because we're not just going to be talking about rosé. We're going to be talking about how to look good while drinking rosé. And I've got my friend and fellow TikToker, Christine Buzan, here to help me out, chat about the pink juice, and um, tell me how to look good and not like an idiot while I'm drinking it. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and hang out with you and get to know everybody. Yeah. Cheers. We have... Do you have some wine in your glass already? Because I feel like this is a podcast. Which one should I start with? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Because I, I have two different rosés. Excellent question. I would say start with the Trian rosé. So it's this one right here. Okay. Um, and for those of you who are part of the wine club and drinking with us at home, I would say if you don't have the, the Lorenza rosé, which is the other, like, it's not in your shipment. Don't worry. You didn't miss a bottle. Um, this is our just like fun secondary rosé. Open your Trian rosé because I think this is a podcast that should feel relaxed and conversational and easy, just like our friend rosé. Um, so yeah, get that in your glass. Okay, so how like, much do I pour? You should pour. Okay, correct. This is these are all great questions. Pour. <laughs> okay, let me see your glass because it should be it should be about like. Four ish ounces is a good amount. You don't want to over pour it because you definitely want rose cold, but you don't want to under pour yes. it because that's annoying. So I yeah. think I think four ounces, three to four ounces is good, which is like depending on your glass is going to sit at about a quarter of the way there. All right, let's cheers. All right, <laughs> cheers to rose and cheers, cheers to summer and here's to looking good while we do it. Um, I should mention yeah. that Christine's whole Instagram, if you're wondering why we keep talking about looking good while drinking rosé, Christine's whole Instagram and TikTok presence is about how to look good in photos. In fact, that is your actual TikTok handle is look good TikTok in photos. Name, yeah. yeah. And your whole thing is like posing and making yourself look good. And I love it. I, fe- I stumbled upon it months ago and I was completely obsessed with it. And I love what you do. And I want to dive into more about what you do because you have a great story. You have a really, I, I took a Thank little you. deep dive into your story. You have a really good story. So as we drink, we'll dive a little bit into that. But for those of you who are lovers of rosé, congrats to you. I did not always love rosé. I think I was like 24, 25 before I kind of started my love affair with it. And I'm not ashamed to admit that I am old enough to remember a time before rosé was cool. Like cool, yeah, definitely. Like, rosé when I moved to New York in 2015, rosé to me, like pink wine to me, I didn't even know what rosé was. Pink wine to me was like sweet white zinfandel, like it wasn't good. Like all I knew was like it was yeah. the sweet stuff in a box or some like giant bottle that was in a fridge somewhere. Um I'm curious if you've had a similar experience. Like, what do you think about when you think of rosé? Yeah, same. I moved to New York in end of 2010, beginning of 2011. And like, mm. rosé was not a thing until mm-hmm. I'd say like 2016, 2017. And I remember then it was just like, also like the frozen rosé became like a really big thing. I think it was like summer of 2017. Like yes. everybody in New York started doing it. So it's definitely had like its, its moment. But I mean, to be honest, I was drinking like crap rosé in America mm. though because like when it had it's like you know with the rise of like the pink wall and like Instagram and everything like rosé all day became like a thing and so it was just it was crap rosé but then I went to Provence in summer of 2017 and I had like you know real Provençal rosé and it was it was good you know because it's yeah. not sickly sweet you know it yeah. has definitely it has a taste and it has some hints of things that are I guess I'm not very good at like naming wine which is you know but you have me here but like you know things that are kind of sweeter but mm-hmm. not sweet it's not like a dessert wine you know so- no yeah I think I think it's like the perfect example of what we talk about when we say this term perceived sweetness meaning like you mm-hmm. smell all of these things that would have natural sweetness so you smell lots of fruit 
But then when, and so your brain sort of tricks you into to thinking that there's actual sugar there. But the reality is these wines are bone dry. There's no sugar in these wines. But because you associate yeah. things like guava and papaya and pineapple with having sweetness, you're like, oh, this is like kind of a sweet wine, which is kind of fun. You kind of get the best of both worlds. Um, interestingly, yeah. rosé, rosé is still on an upswing. I know it feels like maybe the trend has like quieted, but just to give you some fun analytics between 2010 and 2020, retail rosé sales grew 1400%, which I think you and I being in New York probably were in the epicenter of, we got to see that happen. Um, and then still from, from 2020 to 2024, it's still continued. It's still expected to continue growing almost 70%. So we're still, we're still in a rosé moment. I don't think that we are going anywhere. And I think these two rosés that we have on the show today really represent the opposite of what your first experiences were with drinking rosé, which is like, Mm -hmm. these are very quality rosés and they're not expensive. Like that's the other thing. Like, and here's what bums me out about rosé is like, price is really not always indicative of quality. Like there's some really good rosés out there that are the same price as the really bad ones. Um, So I just want to throw that out there because I think we're going to touch on some of the stigmas that are associated with rosé. Yeah. And I think that's like the most challenging thing to navigate, you know, as kind of a wine outside, like a wine appreciator, but not aficionado, you know, it's just in Mm -hmm. terms of choosing, you know, I know that online it's nice because now there are so many sites that do have ratings and kind of like crowdsource information and reactions and suggestions, but it definitely, there is definitely a barrier of entry to wine, especially with things like rosé. Yeah, that's an interesting take. I think you're right. I think rosé, because there is, well, I think because there also was such a big move to make rosé when that that initial upswing in popularity happened, you know, it really just oversaturated the market. And so you had like a, a big pool of really good and bad. And I think you're spot on with saying like, you know, wine sites and retail shops have done a really good job of trying to just be more selective. I mean, we're talking about two that are available on Wine Access, which is, you know, obviously the podcast. But um, I think there again, like if you can lean into and on these retail sites, that's a really good way to go. Before we go any further down the pink rabbit hole, uh, we've got to talk about a few things that not a lot. We don't have a lot going on today in the world of wine, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Christine, because I saw on your Instagram not long ago that you were in the Napa Valley. Yeah. So I went up for um, one of my good friends, Rob Garza, has a band called Thievery Corporation, and he also oh, has yeah. his own project. You should actually have him on this. He's like, yeah. he's awesome. He'd love this. Um, but he also has his project Garza, which um, I work on and with him for, which is really great. So we were up there for Bottle Rock and... Um, his friend Marcus owns Brasswood. So I know Marcus we went over there. very well. He's great. He's so much fun. If Marcus, if you're watching that, um, I love you and I'll definitely come up for your Halloween party this year. Yes. But um, so it was really nice. You know, I, I got to know Marcus and Angelina and kind of everybody who is over there. And it was it was just a really great experience. It was a really good time. And it was a lovely time to go up to Napa. So I definitely want to go back. Um, I love that you know Marcus because Mar- – so shout out to Marcus Marquez who runs Brasswood yeah. Estate in St. Alita. He's like the hardest working man in show business but also just the most fun. So the reason I asked about Napa Valley is because the world's 50 best vineyards have been revealed and the list was very surprising to me because on the list, only four California wineries are in the top 100 and only really? one, yeah, only one is in the top 50. And it's not even in Napa Valley. <laughs> is it in like Temecula or where is that? It's not. It's it's Jordan, which is in Sonoma or Alexander Valley in Sonoma. Okay. Um, the other yeah. three are Dow, which is in Paso, Ridge Montebello, which is Santa Cruz, and then Mondavi, which is in Napa Valley. But that's in mm-hmm. that's that's top 100. It's not top 50. The number one. Yeah vineyard that was ranked and we'll talk about the ranking system because I have questions always but the number one do you do you want to take a gander as to where the number one vineyard is located it's gonna be somewhere completely unexpected it's gonna be like in Australia or something where is that tell me it's a really good guess it is southern hemisphere and there are quite a few Australian wineries on there but it is in Mendoza Argentina I was that was gonna be my second guess (laughs) it's Argentina then 
<laughs> yes, it is Mendoza. And I thought that was really interesting because um, I was just in Mendoza not long ago. And I thought the wineries there were fantastic. And this is, this list yeah. I should add is not, it's it's the best vineyards to visit. This, this is not like the top mm. vineyard for production. Not that Katinga Zapata does not make delicious, beautiful, wonderful wines, but this is purely from like a hospitality standpoint. Um, and I found it so interesting that that California was really not represented on the list because we kind of invented this idea of like winery hospitality. It's like it's and what tourism. we yeah exactly. It's what we do in Napa Valley. Um, so the the lack of representation on the list was interesting. But there were six from Argentina alone in the top fifty, and seven from Chile, which is not a big region. <laughs> also, Chile like the climate in Chile is wild. You have like half a Chile that's Antarctica. You know what I mean? Like basically yes. like, yeah, that's so crazy. So is it just kind of, is it in one area of Chile, like the Northern part or it's, it's most, like, is it so, like you yeah. get to see the penguins and have wine? Cause that would be a top hundred experience for me. <laughs> You know, I don't know. Um, I didn't. I didn't dive deep, deep into. And I've actually never been to Chile to go to go wine tasting. Although I'd love to go. And when I was on this trip, the last on in Mendoza, the, one of the guys who joined us had just come from there, and he was like, "It was wonderful. It was great. You should go." Um, but what I found so interesting about South America in general is like they really, in like, in a short amount of time, have figured out wine hospitality. And I think one of the reasons that they've been able to do that so well is because, you know, in California, it's, I think you live in California now, right? Yeah. I'm in Orange so County. You, so I'm yeah. in Southern California. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, doing business in California, whatever your political stance is, is not always the easiest. And certainly in Napa Valley and Napa County, where there have been a lot of regulations to obviously maintain, you know, the beauty of the land and you know, the resources and whatnot. Argentina and Chile, it's kind of a free for all. So like they can take the best of the new world, right? So they're they're considered part of the new world when it comes to winemaking. So they're not, you know, they're not Bordeaux where they're kind of limited by, you know, the historic preservation of what they've been doing. They can kind of build from the ground up. So because the fact that they're new world and the fact that they are really not regulate. I'm sure there's regulations, but there aren't as many regulations as somewhere in California. It's I think system. they've really been able, I, you know, I don't know what the actual legal ramifications are, but what I'm saying is <laughs> they can have, so unlike in Napa, they can have a restaurant, they can have a hotel, they can have a tasting room, they can taste outside, they can taste inside. At Katinga Zapata, I thought what was really cool is like they're making vermouth underneath and like they're doing this own oh. old stone barn. And so they've really been able to weave in like the magical elements of hospitality that are that exist around wine that aren't necessarily just wines. You can have this like very integrated experience. Doesn't that sound lovely? I feel like I need to go revisit Mendoza now. Yeah, I'd love to go. That sounds amazing. <laughs> It's good there. Uh, and we actually did a whole show on Mendoza and I, I waxed poetic about it and I would happily go again. So I'm very happy for Mendoza's success on this list, which I will say I did a little, little research on the list. Um, when I when I went to the World's 50 Best Vineyards website, uh, if you scroll all the way down, it does say it does list their partners and um, Wines of Mendoza is listed as a partner. I'm just saying, I'm not taking away from anyone, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's separation between church and state, but one has to wonder, you know? No, definitely. I mean, or just in terms of what they've been exposed to the right. most, you know, they right. visited there, they, you know, because right. I mean, I'd imagine it would be challenging to visit all the wineries in the world. I think it is challenging. And it does say in the voting thing that like it's broken up into region. I think there's like 22 different regions that um, the, the voting parties have to be, you know, specialized in. So I don't know. Um, I thought it was all very interesting. And I guess, I guess if you think about it mathematically, like there's a lot of vineyards in California. I wonder if it was just like a numbers game where it was yeah. like so many different people voting for so many different, uh, wineries that the score was just aggregated lower. So I don't know. I'm not a mathematician, but I feel like that math maths or something. Um, <laughs> that math maths. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, all right. Don't make me do any more math in this podcast because I would like to get to my rosé very much. Um, if you are loving this podcast and this is your jam and you like listening to people like Christine and I talk about 
where to visit because I think it sounds like we're about to have a wine trip in our future. Um, this is your moment yes. to like, subscribe, and review. The review being the very key element to this. So take a little moment. Tell us what you love about the show. Give us a five-star review. And if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button and subscribe so that you know when we've got new videos out. I'm just saying we have a good time and you should be part of it. Uh, the other thing that you should be a part of is the wine club. So if you want to hang out and drink with us, which I highly recommend, you can join the Wine Access Unfiltered podcast. It's four bottles every two months, 120 bucks, including shipping, including shipping, plus tax. Um, and then you get 10% off all of your purchases on Wine Access. So you can hang out with us, you can drink the wine, and then you can order more wine after the fact if you really loved it. So those are my plugs. This is your podcast. We're going to get into the wine. So if you don't have it open already, grab that Domain Trien. It's the one with the cute little the cute little pig on it on the front um, and the screw top and put it in a glass. Make sure it's cold and we'll see you back here in just a second. All right, you crazy kids, we are back. And I've got rosé in my glass. Christine's got rosé in her glass. I think it's probably still the right amount. How are you doing over there? You need a little more in your glass? I need a refill. I like, <laughs> I gulp it. So I'll just put a little bit more in there. It's highly gulpable. I will, I will warn this everyone. This is very good. This is one you're going to want multiple bottles of because it just goes down so quickly. So um, this is a sneaky little wine. And it's a sneaky little wine because, one, it goes down very easy, but also – because this is a wine that is helmed by two of the most famous sought after wines uh, in the world, or I guess I should say the vintners who own said wineries in the world. So this is the 2022 Domaine Trienne. Um, this is coming from Provence, and this is helmed by none other than Aubert de Valain of Domaine de la Romani Conti, so DRC for short, for those of you who have heard of it, and then also by Jacques Sace and his son, Jeremy Sace, uh, who are Domaine du Jacques. So this is a pretty rad project because these guys, literally Domaine du Jacques and Domaine de la Romani Conti, they are the two of the most sought after bottles of Burgundy in the world. Um, they're crazy expensive and they have this sneaky little rosé project that's like $20 from Provence. Like who would have thought that like the producers of $3,000 bottles of wine would produce a $20 bottle of rosé. But hey, everybody's got to drink rosé, right? Because that's what they do in France. Um, we love that. So this is going to be a blend of Cinso, Grenache, Syrah, and Merlot. Mostly a classic blend. Actually, it is a, it's a very classic blend except for the Merlot, which I recently learned is very widely planted in Provence. So like nor normally you would hear like Cinso Grenache Syrah. You wouldn't hear the Merlot, but I think it's really interesting that they added in here. Um, this is primarily Cinso and we love Cinso. Cinso is a delicious, delicious grape. It's, it's a huge grape. It's actually one of the few grapes that can be consumed both as a table grape and a wine grape. The only problem is it's got seeds, so that's not so alluring for a lot of people, but it's delicious to eat. Um, and they call it the workhorse of Provence because it does so much. It's a, like I said, it's a thin skin grape, very big berry, lots of juice. And so you have that juice to skin contact ratio that's really light to give it that really nice light color, light body, not too much tannin. Um, and then of course, all of that great, like sweet profile on here. So what do you think? I mean, you've, you've gulped a little bit of it, but yeah, I like it. So this is going to be a dumb question. Is the grape like a purple grape or a green grape? Only purple grapes make wine, right? Excellent question. Love it. We're starting on the right foot. Okay. So let's talk about rosé for a second, how you get there. So rosé is made from red grapes and rosé can really be made in, I'm going to say three ways. There's, there's, yeah, we'll say three ways. The two primary ways are what's called direct press and saigné. So direct press is basically where they take the red grape because you may not know this, all grape juice, with the exception of maybe 1% of varieties, all grape juice is clear. It's not until you macerate yeah. it with the skins that it takes on that color. So instead of macerating it for long periods of time like they would for days and weeks to get that red color, they just let it sit with the skins for like a few hours. And that's how you get this really pretty lovely pale pink color. So you're starting with red grapes. If you started with white grapes, you get an orange wine. 
So you're starting there. The other way that you can make it, and this sort of ties back to one of the great original stories of, of rosé or white Zinfandel for the Americans um, who started drinking the American version of rosé, uh, is what's called sangye. And sangye is significantly less prevalent. A lot of people don't make it this way because it's more expensive. But sangye is basically if you were to macerate your grapes with the your, if you were to macerate the skins with the juice you would have to wait to get all of that gray color, right? So you'd be waiting, 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 waiting. In order to concentrate that color to get it even darker, at the very beginning, you would bleed off some of that juice so that the ratio was lower. And so that juice that you would bleed off, sangye meaning to bleed, that's what you would be left with. And so that story ties back to how the the Sutter Home White Zinfandel came to be because back in the 1970s, uh, Bob Trinquero decided to make to bleed off, and then he sold off that Sanye juice in the tasting room. I think it was like one or two vintages later, he had a stuck fermentation, meaning all, not all the sugar converted to alcohol, and so he was left with this like slightly sweet wine, and people loved it. And that's how the Sutter Home White Zinfandel was created: was this sort of accidental Sanye sweet pink wine. And so when Americans think of rosé or so used to funny. think of rosé, right. So it was total, totally yeah. accidental. So that's Sanye. You really don't see it very much. The third way that you could make rosé, and you really only see this in Champagne because it's pretty much illegal anywhere else where there's legal regulations regarding wine, is, is the combination of red juice and white juice. So you only see that in Champagne where they add a little bit of red to the white to get a pink, but you don't see, you won't see that in, in, in Provence. You really don't see it in the United States anywhere unless it's like super, super cheap wine. Um, but I, I thought that was really interesting. You mentioned that you were in Provence and I took a, I took a little mini deep dive on, on Yeah, you Google. went way deep then. I did. And, and I saw that you worked for L'Occitane. I'm going to butcher this. L'Occitane. 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 Yeah. Is that when you were in Provence? Yeah, so it was when I worked for L'Occitane in Provence. So I was there from um, 2014 through end of 2017 is when I worked for them. So and what were your what were your first thoughts? What did you did you love Provence and like the whole vibe there? Because I feel like that brand really embodies that place. They do. They're they're an awesome brand just in terms of sticking true to their ethos and what they believe in, and really kind of giving back to the community there still, as well as kind of like. The community all over the world you know like my grandma was a fan of the brand my mom was a fan of, so it's something that's just always been in my life you know always so um you know back in 2014 when I was looking for a job within digital marketing and I saw the job I was like so excited and it just kind of worked out and you know I mean I loved working there um I went to Provence with them in 2017 I met the founder and we kind of did like a week long just you know, experience. We stayed at uh, Le Couvent de Menim before. It's recently been renovated. Mm. I really want to go back. So, I um, mean, you know, they have like a Michelin star restaurant in there and just, it was really cool, you know, seeing kind of, we went to the factory where everything's produced. We, you know, saw the lavender fields and everything. And it was, it was a really great experience. And I feel like Provence is like such a vibe, right? And I think you know, Provence, by yeah. the way, is it is the epicenter for rosé. Like literally like this is if you trace the history of how rosé came to be all the way back to like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, like it really did start in Marseille. I mean, it was like what everyone was drinking back. Tourists back in the 19th century were drinking rosé. Kids were drinking it. Parents were drinking it. And so it sort of like lends itself to this like very relaxed, like poolside ocean side sort of vibe. But um, when you were there, like, did you notice how much you were drinking of it and what you were drinking it with? We drank it like for every meal except breakfast, basically. Exactly. But it was <laughs> a lot of, because the thing is like, I'm not really that super into meat. Like I mm-hmm. like fish and I'll eat some chicken, but that's it. So, I mean, basically it was like vegetables, fish and chicken is what I was eating. So yeah. Which is yeah, perfect. Which I is mean, perfect. You know, they had, yeah, they were having some people were having lamb and they do like a red with the lamb and stuff like that. But yeah, so I was I was eating more like kind of the the like lighter meats and everything. Well, that makes sense. I mean, 90% of what Provence produces is rose. They do produce a little bit of red wine and it's quite good, but the food is light, it's airy, it's fresh, and it works so well with the wine. And I, you know, whether you're eating yeah. it with food or whether you're just like drinking it with a side of sunshine, like whatever you choose is what you 
can and should do. And as you said, you basically drink it for every meal except for breakfast. It's just yeah. literally except there. for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it was great. Yeah, the, it was always there. There was always rosé on the table. Yeah. So. And I think what's interesting is like rosé in general, especially now, you know, there's, as we said, there's there's a huge, huge swath of different types of rosés and styles of rosés and qualities of rosés. Um, but what's so cool is, you know, when you're talking about rosé, you can have all of these different experiences with lots of different types of food. Um, I think for me, like as I smell this wine, you know, it has that sort of like ocean spray, melon, guava. Like if you were to like sit by an ocean, like, you know, on like a rocky beach somewhere and like have the sea spray come up at you and like have a fruit plate, like that's kind of what it would smell like. And, you know, they can all smell really, really different, but they also like kind of, especially from Provence, all sort of have this similar vibe. With that in mind, not that I want to like make you chug, but we do have a second (laughs) bottle of rosé that I think we should call attention to because especially if we're talking about, you know, a little bit of the history of rosé. So obviously we talked about the fact that Whites and Vendel was a thing in Napa Valley and that was sort of our American first foray into it. But the reality is it actually stems long before that. So our first example of white Zinfandel actually was in Lodi in California, um, which is where the Lorenza Rosé is from. And so there's two tie-ins to this podcast here that I just want to make mention of because I love when I can find a good tie-in. So number one, look at this color, which is so beautiful and like so different and sort of like peach Melba looking. It's really pretty. Mm, it smells good. Yeah. So 18, I think 1869 is like the first time that we see Whites and Vendel in Lodi, courtesy of the Sinso grape, which is everywhere in Lodi. Um, And there's still some like really old vines that you can see in Lodi that are from like the late 1800s. Really? Yeah. No, it's super. If you can get to Lodi, it's a really cool cool place. Yeah. They have these like super, super old vines. It's very cool. And one of the reasons is because a lot of the vines were own rooted. And so they, they, they didn't get destroyed because of phylloxera like a lot of the other ones did. So you can go see some pretty Mm -hmm. old vines up there. But this is Lorenzo, which is a, it's a mother daughter wine. Um, Mindy and Michelle. So Mindy Kearney and Michelle Ue. And Michelle is a model. She is a full time, like very professional, very well-respected model. And they do this on the side as like a mother daughter gig. And I was reading. Yeah. Isn't that fun? I was reading because I was like, how did she, how did she get her start? Meaning you, how did you get your start? Because what you do on TikTok is so interesting in that all of your videos basically give you tips on how literally how to look good in photos, which seems like such a simple yeah. concept, except that when you watch the video, you're like, oh, there's so much that I've been doing wrong this entire time. And when I went back and I read through some of like your stories that you've told on the internet, um, I saw that you <laughs> the were internet just like, is a wild place. <laughs> on the, <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw that you were just like very observant when you were working as an assistant at these photo shoots Mm -hmm. and you noticed how these models could just sort of like shift position and become these completely different people. And I was like, wow, like, I don't know that I would have noticed that if I were at a photo shoot. Like there's, I'm sure there's a lot going on, but like such an interesting thing for you to observe. And so I was curious, like, like what's, what was it about that that struck you? And do you remember what that was like when it happened? I moved to New York in end of 2010, beginning of 2011, and I had an internship with Marie Claire. And I knew ever since I was like 13 years old, like I wanted to work in magazines. That's like what I wanted to do with my life. That's what I loved. Like I love fashion. I loved kind of more so than fashion itself, just how it's a reflection of what's like going on within our culture in general, that kind of thing. So I had my heart set on that. That was what I was going to do with my life. So I did it. You know, my senior year of college, I was going to University of Washington in Seattle and I'm like, okay, cool. You did. Got everything done. Time to pack up, do my last quarter of my internship, you know? Um, but it became very clear at that point, like that print was dying and mm. that the future was really in digital. So everybody who was aspiring within the magazine or like fashion writing or any kind of like fashion world was starting a blog. So I was like, okay, cool. I need to start my blog. So the fortunate thing about when I'd assist on these shoots was that all the models were like my age. They were between Mm. like 18 and like 22. So 
you know, everybody was older by older. I mean, like, you know, in their thirties or older, but you know, I mean, yeah. When you're a 21 year old girl who's just moved to the city, like, you know, yeah, you're the world is your oyster and there's no, like, you know, everything is frivolous and fun, you know? So, um, I did, you know, connect with these models and I'd ask them questions about, okay, how do you do this? How do you do that? Because I'd see very clearly kind of the process in which they'd move their body. So, you know, I mean, because we had a lot of downtime, it was like 15 hour shoot days, you know, like I'd ask them questions and they'd give me answers. And then I'd practice it for my own blog when I was sharing like my little outfits and stuff like that. So that's kind of really how I gained my basis for it. And everything was like going fine and dandy until finally in 2014, I changed my medicine for my OCD and I gained 70 pounds within one year. And I was like, okay, crap. Like, I, my poses don't look the same. I had to completely learn how to redress myself. So it was a, it was at that point that I kind of deconstructed everything about posing for photos and then Mm. reapplied it to work for my body. And I became really interested in it. And, you know, I was in New York and within kind of the fashion blogging community, and I still have a lot of friends out there, which is really cool. But, you know, I, I give people pointers and help position them and everything, you know, based off of what I learned. And everyone's like, you really have a knack for this. And then mm. around like 2018, I kind of decided to really dive into it and learn every single thing there was to learn about it. And then, you know, I began developing my own methodologies and everything like that. So what did you find was more helpful, the mirror or the actual camera? The actual camera. Yeah, because the mirror just doesn't yeah. tell the same story. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about the mirror, too, is when you're looking in the mirror, you're looking at um, a parallel, something that's completely parallel to you Mm. at eye level. And a lot of the times, you know, when people are taking photos, it's very unreliable. You might get somebody at eye level. You might get somebody above you. You might get something way lower than you. And then you have the lens tilt to compromise for. So honestly, I think the most helpful thing is getting a tripod, setting your camera up in forward facing mode and getting a Bluetooth remote or setting a self timer, or even like if you're just practicing, just Mm -hmm. letting a video run in forward facing mode. So you know, okay, the lens is this height, this is how you can adjust your body in Mm. relation to the lens. That's definitely the most helpful. And is it mostly like, is it geometry? Is it emotion? Like, I know a lot of the things that I've seen from you, like, have to do with like positioning of the hands and like your legs and like finding angles. But like, I have to like, I, I think back to like, you know, the traumatizing time of watching Merrick's Next Top Model and Tyra Banks being like, we're smizing. And I'm like, what does that mean? I don't, what is smizing? So like how much of it is like internal and how much of it is geometry? I'd say it's a lot of physiology. Mm. That's kind of what it, um, you know, and even in terms of how I break things down, because this is where I think kind of what I do is very different. And the way I kind of um, use the analogy whenever like I talk with the media is like, okay, what I try to do is what beauty YouTubers started doing in 2008. Because before then it's like, oh, accentuate your eyeballs, but it's mm. like, or your eyeballs, you know, accentuate your eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what does that mean? You know, right. <laughs> like, so it's actually like breaking down kind of what these abstract things like smizes, et cetera, mean. And it's things like, you know, when you smize, it's like, you know, your orbital bone area, which is actually sphincter muscle tightens, but you don't want, you know, the complete eyes to like tighten. So you have to get this ligament up here to go back, you know, it's like kind of, and I'm not, you know, a scientist by any means, but a lot of it is kind of understanding how the body works and really simplifying it in very easy to understand ways that Mm. make sense to people. It seems like something that like now in retrospect makes so much sense for you to have really dived deep into, but like, would you say that you're just a very curious person in general, or was this just because like this was out of need? It was both. It's both out of need and it's out of curiosity and Mm. kind of like a weird, you know, like obsession. Like Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who I, you know, like, I mean, the thing is I have a very loud and like boisterous personality, but I'm also like a very introspective person. You know, I mean, my father, was a professor for 40 some odd years. So Mm. I kind of grew up just thinking, oh, well, you have, my dad was a political science professor. Like you have one thing and that's kind of like your thing in life. It's not like, oh, I'm a sales manager. And then I go home. It's like, oh no, like this is, you know? Yeah. So I just always assumed that. And I've, you know, I've always loved photography my entire life. And it's something that, um, you know, I studied a lot in 
high school and in college and everything like that, just for fun, just out of um, a love for it. But really, it came out of the necessity of kind of the experience that I had when I gained weight and I didn't know how to present myself. And I saw Mm. just how things were changing within the digital landscape, you know, like more and more, if you're able to be like, oh, wow, photos are frivolous, it doesn't matter. That is an intense, immense privilege. Because whether you're trying to get a job, you need a photo. If you're going on a dating site, you need a photo, you know, like you're trying to make friends or like apply for a charity board or anything like photos are really kind of how we express ourselves to the outside world. And, you know, unfortunately, it's very easy to make judgments, not only that are appearance based, but actually like, kind of inferences that people gain about your personality or your level of competency based off of the photos that you have. Mm. So I just found that there wasn't, especially for women, just good advice that gives them the ability to advance in whatever they want to advance in by getting over the fear of being in front of the camera. And I looked at my own life, you know, as a like 220 pound size 14 woman, you know, like I should not have had as much kind of mainstream success as I've had, you know, like I was on the cover of red book magazine, September issue back when they were in publication, you know, I've done like good morning America. I've done like countless access Hollywood, countless news things that, you know, people, and I'm a small fat person, but people of my size have not, you know, like had that opportunity in a mainstream way. And a lot of that is just because of my ability to be in front of the camera and getting over that fear. And I know that we all kind of have different goals out of life and, you know, you may not want to do what I do and I may not want to do what you do, but you know, the photos and videos and everything are a reality that isn't going away. So I just want people to be able to like go out and do what they want to do and not have that barrier of entry. So that's really kind of what, I guess, like what drives me, if that makes sense. I totally understand this need, uh, this, like having this very curious brain. I think a lot of people in wine feel this way because wine is one of those things that you can go down an endless rabbit hole with. But when you have curiosity that meets necessity, like that is really just such a fire combination that once, once you dive into that, there's no going back. And for me, like wine was not necessarily necessity, except that it was, I saw that in New York as an access to places I wanted to go and a life that I wanted to have. That is, yeah, that's so true. It's funny. I never, never thought of it that way. Well, and the other sort of like Venn diagram that I think that you're experiencing that I also experience is like, you know, you say that you have access and you've gotten things that maybe you shouldn't have gotten, right? You talk about the Red Book cover, which is amazing. And I went back and looked at it. I was like, that is so 2015 September issue. Like that is so cool. You look amazing on the cover, you know, being on Good Morning America. Like, you know, I think when we talk about these other Venn diagrams, like you have, you have multiple niches that you've combined to make you one of one. And when I think about what I do, you know, I have a background in theater. I am in wine. I am female. I'm very curious. Like there's all these things that I, you know, when I think about the things that I've gotten to do and I feel that sort of imposter, imposter level syndrome of, you know, am I worthy of getting these accolades? Am I worthy of doing these things? Like, shouldn't someone who's more expert level get to do these? I think about, you know, the fact that like, the reality is this Venn diagram has come together to make me and you one of one. Like there's only one Christine Buzan. There's only one person who does what you do and who can do what they do. Because the reality is you've been doing this since 2012, right? 2010. Yeah. 2010. Yeah. I mean, like you've been doing this for a very long time. And I think it's interesting that people would probably call you an overnight success now. I'm sure a lot of, right. Do you get that a lot? Like, oh, well, you're doing yeah, so well. all the time. <laughs> and yeah. And it's funny because like, it's just, it's odd, but it's the thing that's cool though, about, I guess the unique position you and I are in. And I think it's actually been, it's been longer than you think that we've been following each other on TikTok. Mm. Um, Cause I know that you and I, I think I was at like 300 K back when we first started following each other. Oh, it was, wow. It was a while ago. It's interesting too, just being within the point in history we're at right now. And I hope anybody who's watching this knows like you can literally do whatever you want to do. Totally. I think when I think back on some of like, even some of the wines that we've had over the course of the show, and I think the Lorenzo is a a great example, right? Like this is a wine that was just a passion project for this mother and daughter, like 20 years ago. And, you know, Michelle's a very successful model. Her mom was very successful in Napa Valley. And they took this, like, this fierce combination of two people who had very unique, but 
uh, complementary skill sets. And so instead of one person, they took, you know, multiple Venn diagrams and put them together to create this wine here. And I think, um, I don't know if you've tasted it yet, but like, it's so it's different. So good. The typeface it's, too, for anyone at home, like the typeface is beautiful. Isn't it, beautiful? it is beautiful. Well, and like, look, and then look at the typology on the back as well. Yeah, no, they're, I mean, they're brilliant at branding. And I think like, again, when we think of these Venn yeah. diagrams, even with the Trian Rosé, you know, like, just the amazing things that happen in the world when we put these Venn diagrams together, when people are allowed to sort of step outside their comfort zone, you know, when two producers who make some of the most historic, important wines in Burgundy get to step outside of their comfort zone and make something completely different. And, you know, the fact that like, it still kind of like remains under the radar, like nobody really knows that it's affiliated with Aubert de Villain and, and, and Jacques and Jeremy Sais, but like, here we are. But I think, you know, to go back to this wine a little bit, like, two completely different rosés made from essentially the same grapes, right? Um, the only different, real difference being the fact that like it's mostly Cinso in the Trian and then mostly carrying on in the Lorenza. Um, you know, you've got the addition of Merlot, but like even like the color, the style, like I don't know if you've noticed the texture of these wines. Like texture for me is one of those things that we don't talk, allow, talk about enough outside of the trade world in the consumer world, but texture is so important to me when I'm, when I'm tasting a wine. And so like texturally, these are very different in that you get more of this like angular profile. Like it, it stands very upright. It feels very, um, you know, it feels very statuesque in some ways, like, you know, relaxed, but like almost if you looked at like Michelle in a photo, like she's very statuesque and very angular, but she has a relaxed nature to her. And so like, that's what this wine sort of reminds me of. It's just this like, you know, very tall, beautiful woman. That's like, you know, sort of like hat, like, would pose in the way that you would tell me to pose, but I probably could never pull off and she makes it look so easy. But like this like very relaxed, but like angular nature is like sort of where I'm at with yeah, this. Yeah, kind of like the Giselle Bündchen. I feel like Giselle Bündchen is like the queen of exactly. angular, relaxed posing. You know what you should do? Tell me. You should do TikToks on like, okay, like the characters of friends if they were rosés. Yes. I'd say almost this one's like a Monica. Like this is... The Lorenza is the Monica. Okay. Cause it's, it's Lorenzo's a little more like, Monica. yeah, it's, I could see that it's a little more, uh, uptight yep. and yeah. Yeah. In a good way. Yeah. Um, this one, like, it, this isn't a Phoebe. I'd say like, I feel like it's a Ross. Like it's kind of a, it's a sneak, like, you know, how like Ross was like funny and like, like weird sneaky ways you know, and he like yeah. every now and then he would be kind of like cheeky. Yeah. He was like very, like this yeah. is a serious wine, right? Like the, the two serious yeah. guys make this wine, but like, it's kind of cheeky and yeah. funny. Like he was the paleontologist. It who is. Just, like, had some great one-liners that you were like, wait, I didn't know you like had personality yeah. in there. That's totally this wine. Good call. Way to go with the Yeah, but reference. also like if you're in a crisis, you're going to want Ross to help you. I feel like this is almost like there's something kind of more comforting about this wine in a way, well you know, played. like. <laughs> well played. Yes. I yeah. definitely want Ross over Monica in a crisis. Also, I love that they're brother and sister. Um, definitely yeah. want Ross in a crisis. And like, you know, I'll be there for you. So I feel like the Trian, like, you know, obviously that's going to like, it has the pedigree, but I feel like this, the Lorenza is kind of more a unique, it's just different, mm, you know? Definitely. So I feel like that's kind of, you know. You just kind of pull it out. I will say for those who have, who have had the Lorenza before, I think it's still very much in line with what they have made in years past. But I think this one has more of a serious nature to it than I've mm -hmm. had in vintages past. And it could just be a function of it's a very fresh wine. This is this is 2022 and it was under screw top. So, you know, give it time. Uh, so it could be that. But I, I really... I'm really liking both right now for different reasons. Um, speaking of giving it time, rosé is really meant to be consumed young. Like, as you'll notice, both of these are screw top bottles. Screw top, not that they can't age. The Aussies are going to come for me if I say that screw top can't age because they can. But usually when you see something in a screw top, it means it's it's meant to be enjoyed young. So there's really very limited oxygen exposure, right? So rosé you know, drink it within the first year to two of its life, you know, when it first comes out. Um, after it's been open, it really is a function of how, how much is in the bottle and then where you're going to store it. So if you store it in the fridge, that's the best way to store it um, because okay. you're talking about oxidation, which is a chemical reaction, and we slow chemical reactions by keeping them cool. So you're going to want to put it in the fridge, get, you know, put that screw top back on super, super tight. 
And all that's going to happen over the course of the next like three to five days is you're going to feel that acidity start to wane. Chemically, that's not what's happening, but you're going to, you're not going to notice the acid be as high. And then you're going to also notice that some of the flavors and the aromatics are going to start to mute a little bit. And that's really just a function, again, of oxidation. If you were to drink this wine two weeks later and it still tastes good to you, totally fine. There's no such thing as like, <laughs> you, there's no not like wine. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill you, right? They don't go bad in that way. But I would say consume both of these if you can within the first like two to five days of their life. I actually opened this uh, Trienne on Monday, so Friday. Saturday, Sunday. So it's been open for four days. And I have to say, okay. it actually hasn't gone anywhere. Like it's still really delicious okay. and aromatically and on the palate, like almost identical. I didn't, I didn't have a lot out of this bottle. So, you know, the more you have in the bottle, the less quickly it's going to go somewhere because there's less oxygen in the, in the actual bottle. Um, but like four days later, I'm still pretty happy with it. I think rosé in general is just a wine that kind of like lasts a longer time. I don't know exactly why that is, but I'm not, I'm never, I'm, for me, red wine goes faster than white wine and yeah. rosé. Um, in terms of temperature, like straight out of the fridge is fine. You know, don't get it like icy, icy cold. Like you don't want there to be ice crystals in there. Cause like then you really won't taste anything. Um, and then in terms of glassware, like I have these in proper glasses, but this is also not the kind of wine that you have to have in a proper glass totally fine with it in a tumbler. I'm fine with it in like poolside. If it has to be in plastic or something that's non-breakable, that's good too. Like this is really just meant to be a wine that's easy to enjoy with a lot of different things. It's also a way more food-friendly wine than people realize. Um, and I don't know if you've yeah. ever noticed this with rosé, but it's just, and maybe you did in Provence, like it just seems to go with everything. Um, a lot of people drink rosé at Thanksgiving because it works with so many different foods. I mean, it's it's the kind of oh, that's wine. Interesting. Yeah. Well, like if you think about it, like, you know, this wine still has tannin because it had contact with the skin. Um, in some cases, like they are aged in wood. So there's, you know, the, the additional wood tannin. And then because it has so much acidity, uh, you know, you also have that added bonus. I mean, you talk about like, you know, the tenets of food pairing, like you need acid, you need tannin, you know, for most foods, you want a little tannin, a little acid to go with a lot of different things. But one of my favorite things to do, if you have uh, and I know you're in Orange County, so you probably have access to some pretty good produce. One of the best things to do, especially during the summer, is get fresh radishes. And okay. I like to just do like a quick little, um, what is that called? When you boil it really quickly and flash, I forget what the word for that is. But anyway, just boil them really quickly for like a minute and then put it in cold water. There's a word for that. It's a chef's term and I can't believe I'm Yeah, what is that it, but- called? Oh, it's going to kill me. And I know there's like a thousand yeah. people listening to this episode that are like, it's this. You're all Thank yelling you. at us right now. I know. I yeah. know. <laughs> anyway, do that. Um, just to, you know, just to get a little, I think those flavors really come out when you do that. And then you want them, don't, you want them cold and you want them raw. Uh, get uh, really good butter and get it like kind of creamy and whipped and a little thing of Maldon salt on the side. This is going to sound super weird, oh, but yeah. you're going to take the radishes, dip them in butter, and then put a little Maldon salt. You maybe had it in Provence or you maybe had it before, but yes, that I've, radish, yeah, I've definitely had that before. Yeah. Radishes, butter, and salt with rosé is like, um, it's, it's the best. It's my favorite like yeah. summertime snack. And I'm not the kind of girl that's like, eh, snack on vegetables. It's not me. This no. is delicious. <laughs> I'm here for it. No, it it is fun. <laughs> yes, I've had it before. My sister actually loves it. So the other thing that Jeremy says said that he really loves with their rosé, which is the Trian rosé, is salted Marcona almonds. I, Interesting. I have never personally What's had them. What's a Marcona but that almond? Is that? It's what, just, it's like the ones that? you would get at Trader Joe's. <laughs> so it's the ones okay. that are like, it's the ones that are like, they're kind of flat and oil. They usually have like oil and salt on them. Like sometimes you can get them okay. with like rosemary. Um, they're just not the raw, like the ones with the skin on yeah. them. Yeah. They're like, they're more flat and they're, they're very okay. delicious and kind of almost sweet like a cashew is. Anyway, apparently that's very good. I love cashews. Yeah, me too. Cashew butter, cashews. I'm not a nut person, but I, I'm on board for cashews and almonds. I think you could do a lot of different things. I mean, vegetables, you could do lighter proteins, salads. I mean, I I at one point said that rosé was the denim of wine back when I wore denim with everything. Um, I'm not sure that I would do that today, but I still maintain that it's still the denim of wine. It's versatile versatile. That's what I was going for. 
in terms of like preparation, you don't need to decant them. You don't need to do anything special. Like they are how they are. Um, and then looking for good ones, you know, I think one of the the biggest stigmas and how do you, when you see a rosé that's darker in color, does that immediately signal anything to you? It gives me the illusion that's going to be sweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It makes me think it's going to be like a sweet, like Zinfandel. Like that's what I think. A lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Cause like, I mean, this is kind of dark, but it still has that kind of like, I, it's almost like an apricot color that I'm like, okay, that's cool. Like, you know, I can go for that. A lot of people feel that way. And I, I get that because I think it goes it goes into that perceived sweetness thing I was talking about earlier and that like the color tends to tell a different story than what is actually true. So the color has nothing yeah. to do with sweetness. Like, I mean, this one is really pale, but it tastes different than it looks, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. I, In my I, mind. You know I what I mean? So. Yeah. I think if you were to taste this, I think if you were to taste the Lorenza blind, you'd have a really hard time pinpointing whether it was red or white. And you may not call it yeah. rosé either. I think if you were like tasting out of like a dark glass, it would be difficult. Um, it's a really- Yeah, it's very interesting. So the color really has more to do with the fact that uh, it has to do with the grape varietal and then it has to do with how long it macerated with the skins. So you can have super dark rosés that are completely bone dry. You can have them be super sweet. It, you know, most of the rosés that we see- on the shelves are bone dry, meaning they're free from residual sugar. Um, In terms of like where we're looking for region, you know, Provence is obviously one of the most famous places that rosé comes out of. Um, Some would say that Provence, you know, is kind of has like overdone it in the years. I still have really good luck with, you know, just buying a Provence rosé. The other place that's turning out really, really great rosés right now is Spain. And it's it's the second largest producer of rosé on the planet right now. Um, and so one of the grapes that I see coming out of there that I, I actually almost used for this shipment was uh, from a grape called Monastrel. And it's really interesting and delicious and gives you less of these like melon, guava, tropical things and a little bit more of this like sort of savory umami version of rosé, which, you know, sometimes can be the case. And I, I really loved it. Yeah. So you can have a lot of different like versions of rosé. And then, of course, California and I think especially in Lodi you can get a lot of value there. So one of the things, you know, one okay. of the hacks in life for finding a great bottle of wine is like the more specific the location, the more likely the quality will be higher on the wine. So if you're unsure, like if you're between a few different bottles of rosé and there's one that has a more specific location like Lodi or even, you know, nobody really does single vineyard, but that's generally a pretty good indic pretty good indicator of quality versus something that's just like California appellated. So location is, is a good way to look at it. I don't, you know, I think grape variety is a little bit harder to figure out, but Grenache, Syrah, Cinso, Morved, those are the grapes that, you know, produce those really lovely, more pale colored, easy drinking rosés like we're having now. Um, and then you can drink them all year. Like, don't feel like you got to throw them out come September. Like they're delicious all, all year long. Apparently they drink them on this, in the ski resorts in France now. It's like it's their go-to on the terraces. That kind of makes sense though, you know? Right. Like it's like yeah. light. So it's like you're doing a physical totally. activity. It's like, yeah, I'm going to want like a rosé. Any other questions? Anything that we didn't cover on the rosé front? Okay. So this is like another dumb question, but Mm-mm. letting the wine breathe before mm-hmm. you drink it with rosé, like what's the rule for that? So in general, like air is always good for a wine, good for a good wine. Air can make a really bad wine, more shitty, but good for a good wine. But with rosé, like it's kind of a pop and pour. Like you don't need to decant it. You don't need to give it air. It will definitely change with air. But, you know, the way that rosé is made, it's, it's really kind of giving you everything that you want up front. And the whole reason that we would give a wine air is to see more, you know, for the wine to give us something different. In this case, you know, the wine will change a little bit, but it's not going to change a lot. You know, it's not going to open very much. It's not going to give you, you know, you can decant whites, you can decant champagnes, but mostly we decant red wines. And so this wine doesn't really fall under that category. So give it air if you want, but that's why I said glass wise, you're kind of fine in whatever, whatever vessel. It's really more about temperature than anything else. You want this wine to be cold. You don't want to drink it room temp. Okay. That that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like a martini, right? Like if you the more you shake it, the more cold you get it, the less you're gonna taste. So you wanna find that sweet yeah. spot where you want, you know, 
get a little bit of of what you of what the wine is giving you and then it, as it comes to a, a lower or higher temperature it's going to start giving you more i think than air will these are both really yeah. delicious and i'm so glad that we got to have both of them um just to recap we have the 2022 Lorenza Rosé from Lodi from Mindy Kearney and Michelle Oulet. We love them. Um, Wine Access, I think, has this every year at this point, and I love it. Um, and then we had the 2022 Trienne Rosé, and this is coming. This is actually um, IGP from the Mediterranean, so this is not technically labeled as a Provence Rosé, but it's from the VAR in the Provence. And they, the reason that they do that is um, I'm told that they get if they're actually – Production's got a, got a little bit larger, and so they're sourcing from a few more places, um, which is all good because, you know, I trust those guys implicitly. So if they want to grab some grapes or some juice from somewhere else, totally fine by me. Um, Christine, where can people find you aside from TikTok at Look Good in Photos? Yep, Look Good in Photos on TikTok. I'm the Christine Buzan on Instagram. And then you can get my um, posing guide, 101 Ways to Pose at howtoposeforphotos.com. Amazing. Yes. Your posing guide looks amazing. Yep. And I saw that there was a free hands one as well that I'm very interested There's in. There's a free hand posing guide. Yeah. Yes. We, we love a free ebook that leads us into, you know, the paid stuff. So it was such a pleasure having you. Thank you so, so much for diving into your past with me talking about all things Venn diagrams and roses. Oh, I know what I forgot to ask you. Do you have any yes. tips for posing with a wine glass? Is that too niche? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, there's a lot you can really do with it. I mean, of course, there's like kind of the cheesy, like, you know, we're posing here. But also there's a lot of different fun poses people have been doing, like where they're kind of covering their face with the wine or there's like a close up of like their eye with the wine mm. or, you know, you can drink with the wine or you can hold the wine and look off to the side. I think the main thing is going to be, you know, being mindful of your camera placement and if you're sitting at a table you just don't want too much of the table in the foreground. So you can either crop that out, but um, going higher, if you have like a great background, you can incorporate into your photo or a bit lower if you want it to be more dramatic. But I mean, wine glasses are so they, I mean, they just look very seductive in themselves. And then mm. there's the ability to kind of hide behind it or drink in it or, you know, like hold it. So just kind of, it. you know, experiment. And really the thing is like, take a bunch of different snaps of you just kind of interacting with the wine glass. Yeah. The key is like lots of different choices, right? Because it's diversity. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, even if you're holding it in one spot, making adjustments with your face in yes. between where you're holding it with your hand is always really helpful. Your tips are so good. And I've, I have legitimately Thank used you. them in real life. And actually when I was in Italy, um, these last few weeks, I ha like, I had you in my mind. I was, I had my hands, my thighs, I had angles, I was working it. So I have lots of really good pictures. Thanks to you. I love that. Yes. Those of you who are listening and watching and going on your own wine trips or otherwise, um, and you want good photos when you come back, definitely look up Christine, get her tips for all things posing and make sure you're drinking some darn good wine while you do it. Go ahead and like, subscribe, and review this podcast if you haven't done that already. If you want to follow us on Instagram, you can do so at Wine Access Unfiltered. And if you are taking cool pics with your wine glasses or with these wines, go ahead and tag us and we'll repost them. It'll be fun. Christine, thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure. And thanks to all of you out oh, there. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Talk to you later. Cheers. Cheers.